Greetings. Let us get started in chapter two, where we're going to talk about forces. Before we start talking about forces, let's try to figure out where we're coming from with this. At this point, you should probably remember Newton's first law of motion, that an object in motion tends to stay in motion, and an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by a net external force. Our goal is to try to figure out where the heck that's coming from, what the heck it means, and how we do something with it. So let's consider this. I have a car showing here. This car is initially traveling with some speed, v naught, and it slows over some distance x to a stop. So if I wanted to, I could make use of some of the information that we have from the last chapter and draw a motion diagram where it has some speed v naught, and then as time goes on, that speed, that's a little too dramatic. That speed decreases, these are definitely getting smaller, and then it stops. All right? And I would say that there is a delta V going in the opposite direction of the car's motion. And at this point, what we want to recognize is that this means that there is a change in the car's motion. That means that the velocity of the car has changed. And that means there has been some acceleration. Now, in order to talk about this, what we really want to get to is what causes the car to accelerate. And that's the back half of Newton's first law, that whole net external force business. So let's start getting some terminology out of the way here. we got a whole bunch of things. So first, we're going to talk about a system. A system is going to be an object or a collection of objects we are analyzing. So that is not what I wanted to have happen. So in this case, I could say that my system is my car. That is a weird car. And the idea is that this system, I'm going to make this little barrier here, protecting it from everything else. There might be a whole bunch of stuff in the car. You know, maybe the car has like some old coffee mugs filled with water. Uh, maybe there are people in the car, you know, old mixtapes from God knows when. But I'm going to take this, everything in my system, everything inside of this, the car, all of its moving parts, and I'm going to turn it into a dot. This dot represents my system. Now, once I have a system, I need to talk about everything else. And the environment is going to be everything that's not in our system. So I come over to my car, you know, maybe there is the moon. Maybe there are the stars. Maybe there is... Um, I'm going to go with McDonald's. And there's a building near the McDonald's, just not the M. That McDonald's looks like it's in my system, though. Ow, 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 darn McDonald's. A cat. All of these things are in my environment. They are outside of my system. That means they can interact with my system. And so we're going to call these things our external interactions. Interactions being pushes, pulls, any kind of contact between a system and its environment. We're also going to be able to talk about internal interactions, although they're not going to matter as much to us. And that would be interaction between objects or parts of objects inside of our system. So if I'm, you know, tapping the wheel of my car in tune with the beat, or in time with the beat, that's an internal interaction, because both me and the car are inside of the system, and I'm hitting the wheel. If the cat, you know, rubs up against the wheel of my car, that's an external interaction, because the cat is in my environment outside of my system. And then the last kind of thing we want to talk about here is a force. And what is a force? Again, a force, not the force. Although I love the force too. Let's, not be, let's, let's be serious here. The force awoke. It's wonderful. Anyway, continuing. Um, so a force is a quantity, some physical thing we can measure, describing the interaction of two objects. It relates the strength of the interaction and the direction of the interaction. And that, when we see strength and we see direction, that means... Force is a vector. It has magnitude and direction. Now, there are some specific forces that we want to consider. First, the force of gravity, Fg. Every force is, on, is between two objects. So that's this whole on object, by object nonsense we got going on here. It's always an interaction. So gravity is the force on an object by Earth. It's the weight of an object. And it's always directed down, specifically towards the center of Earth. 
The reason we're pulling out these specific forces is because some of them we're going to have models for in terms of their magnitude. Some of them we're going to have information about in terms of their direction. Right now, the direction is what we're focusing in on. So gravity, always going to be down. We're going to have a normal force on an object by a surface. And this force acts perpendicular to a surface. It's the thing that keeps you from falling through stuff. So the reason you can sit your tuchus down in a chair and not wind up on the floor, or heaven forbid, like, catapulting yourself, not catapulting yourself, but like falling endlessly towards the center of the Earth, it's because of this normal force. It's kind of the sum total of the electrostatic interaction between the atoms in your tuchus and the atoms in your chair, but for us, it's perpendicular to a surface. You put something on a table, this thing points up if your table is flat. If you put it on a ramp, it points in a slightly tilty bit. And by this I mean, if I have a slightly tilty ramp, then the normal force is going to be in the direction perpendicular to this slightly tilty ramp. We will see examples of that down the line. Tension, so thick you could cut with a knife, um, also because it's related to ropes. You could also cut those with knives. So the tension is gonna be a force on an object by a rope, so it's gonna make this very specific, and it acts in the direction of the rope. So if I am suspending you know, a fancy watermelon by two ropes, then the free body diagram for this watermelon Everybody, we haven't talked about this yet, but we will in a second, is going to involve the tensions from these ropes pointing in the direction of these ropes. Then also it's weight because, you know, the earth still wants a piece of this watermelon. Everybody does. It's delicious. And lastly, we have friction, which I cannot spell apparently. Ooh, that's it's not a word. Let's try that again. Um, so friction is on an object by a, uh, by a surface, but this time it's going to act along a surface instead of perpendicular to surface, and it's going to oppose motion. So if I'm trying to go forward, friction is going to be backwards. If I'm trying to fall down, friction is going to act up. It's always going to act in the opposite direction of motion. So if we come back to our car, here is my system again. It is the car. So in the environment, we have things like the road, the earth, the air, the moon, PNC Park, the Ellis School. I want to iron out and focus only on the things that are interacting with my car. So the moon, not so much. PNC Park, not so much. The Ellis School, not so much. There's definitely air around my car. The earth is always, that's that interaction due to gravity. And the road is definitely in contact with my car. So these are things that I care about. However, to make our lives just a little bit easier, we're going to leave air resistance for AP Physics. So just the road and the earth. Now, to kind of categorize this information, we're going to want to make a thing called a free body diagram or a force diagram. And these are the steps we're going to follow to do it. We've already sketched the situation before. We've ID'd the system. We've ID'd our external interactions, the things that we're interacting with. We don't need to be able to put a name to all of them specifically because we can always call a force on something by something, on the car by the road, on the car by the earth. It's helpful to remember some of those terminologies, but... You know, we can always just kind of stick to it as on something, by something. But let's focus in on these last steps. Draw a dot to represent your system. All right. My system is the car. Draw arrows to represent the forces, the external interactions. Well, I have gravity, which is going down. I have a normal force, which is going up. And because I'm slowing down... I must have some force that's acting against my motion. So I'm going to have some force acting to the left. As you recall, the car was traveling to the right. Now we, did, we need to label these. This one, FG, on car, by earth. FN, the normal force, because it's chilling out on the road. On car, by road. You'll notice the earth is the whole planet. The road is just the bit that I'm near. And then this is probably friction causing me trouble here. On car, by road. So the road can cause a force in multiple directions, even in the same problem. Useful to know. We're going to do a lot more of these as time goes on, but the basic rules are always draw a dot for your object. Um... Draw the arrows to represent the forces that are acting on it. You have identified already the interactions that are going on, the things that are in contact with it, and then label them. Now, 
if we're doing these, we need to be careful because there's some other details to worry about. Specifically, because these are vectors, these arrows have meaning. Their direction matters and their length matters. So let's think about how we add forces. Consider for a second a giant stuffed bear being fought over by you and your cousin. If I look at this, I can see a couple things that are interacting with this bear. Ah, uh, you are interacting with the bear. Your cousin is interacting with the bear. The earth is interacting with the bear because the bear has mass. And the bear seems to be sitting on a surface. So I'm going to go at this. I'm going to say there is some force Fg on the bear by earth. There is some force Fn on the bear by the ground. There is some force, uh, which I can just label as an F. I could call it a pull. I'm just going to leave it as F on the bear by your cousin. And some force, notably larger, on the bear by you. Now, when we're doing this, we're going to worry about problems in one dimension at a time. What that means, I can worry about what's happening to the bear vertically, or I can worry about what's happening to the bear horizontally. Since we're fighting over the bear, let's pay attention to the horizontal stuff. So to recap what's happening here, we've got a small force to the right by your cousin. I'm going to just stick with the shorthand labels. And then a big force to the left by you. When we add these, we're going to add them just like they were positions and displacements. We go forward, we go backward. And it's as simple as this. The net force, the sum of these forces, is F by U. And then I'm going to take at the tail end of that and draw the force of your cousin. Oof. I'm going to try to draw the force of your cousin. And then the net force, the sum of the forces, just like kind of net income, is this leftover bit. So this is coming back to this idea of Newton's first law. That an object in motion tends to stay in motion, and an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by a net external force. This net is what we're talking about here. It's the, let, it's the resulting force when I've added up all of the forces. Doesn't mean we're talking about fishing. Doesn't mean we're talking about gladiatorial combat. It means that we've added up, in this kind of vectory arrow sense, all of the forces acting on the object. I'm going to specify we're only going to worry about in a given direction for now. We're going to stick to 1D cases. Now, this is a whole lot of words to say that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So an object with some velocity tends to keep that velocity. And an object at rest tends to stay at rest even if that velocity is zero, unless acted upon by net external force. We now know, after finishing chapter one, basically this just means an object only accelerates when acted upon by a net external force. And so this is what we're doing in these first couple bits. We want to get this idea that forces, when there is a net external force, some net force, some unbalanced force from the outside, that causes an acceleration. So if we go back to this tug of war, answer it for me. Not right here, maybe in your notes. Who wins? What happens in the next minute with the bear? It is, you know, the tension is real. So hopefully this gets you started. This is going to cover stuff from sections 2.1 through 2.5-ish. Two 2.5 two has a bit of stuff in it that we're not going to focus too much on, but you may want to flip through it a little. Happy hunting.